Welcome everyone to the um, Tuesday, March 10th school board meeting and if everyone could join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Alan, do you have any adjustments to the agenda? I just have one adjustment, and that is under um, 6B. We have middle school and fun coast staff medical leave requests. I also have uh, one for an extended leave, excuse me, that probably should not go there. It should go under the new business. So why don't we add it as... 7G? Yes. So we'll put it there because that, that one is business. Yeah, okay. Um, I would just like to request or su make a suggestion or request to the board if we could possibly move um, public comment on agenda items from the end of the budget to immediately, at the very beginning of the new business section, right before um, we um, vote on adoption of the superintendent's budget. And if I, we do that, limit the time to 10 to 15 minutes. So move. Second. Any comments or questions or suggestions? OK, all those in favor? Thank you. So we will have public comment um, right at the beginning of new business, and we will limit it to 10 to 15 minutes. OK. Um, comments by student reps. Uh, OK, we have a very tall student rep <laughs> <laughs> from the middle school. Older than usual. Yeah. <laughs> Still What's that movie where you age backwards? You know, the new <laughs> That's a good one. Hey, there's no respect. <laughs> Um, I, was, I received an email from uh, Mark Parker, who was a parent at the middle school. Actually, I think he's a parent at all three schools. And this is about the uh, chess team, so I'll share this information. Um, the main state scholastic team chess tournament was held today, and that was dated uh, March 7th in Orono. The Cape Elizabeth Tata 6 team continued its remarkable run, winning the championship for the third consecutive year. The winning team was comprised of Matthew, Matthew Fishbein, a perfect 4-0 oh in his rounds, along with Wes Parker, Matthew Reale Hatem, Jack Demeter, Leo Wing, and Will Krieger. The team finished with 15 out of a possible 20 points and beat the second place team, Deer Isle Stonington, the other perennial powerhouse, by one and a half points. Our K-8 or junior high division team was smaller this year and fell short of its goal to defend its 2008 state championship but nonetheless made an impressive showing with 13 out of 20 possible points to take a clear second place behind the junior high school champion, Deer Isle. Brett Parker led the team with a perfect 4-0 record and was joined by strong play from the, from the remainder of the group, including Anthony Pachero, Danny Brett, Nick Shedd, and Ethan Dupere. For the first time this year, Cape entered the team into the K-3 division. Zale Rasco, Kyle Russell, and Olivia Reale Hatem made the long trip and did Cape proud with solid play and great sportsmanship. Undoubtedly, they will contribute to the future and ongoing success of the K-16. Do um, you want me to do the literature one now or wait? And we can... We'll have come to that. We'll get it. Okay. Congratulations to all of those chess teams. Um, also, I apologize. We need to go back and do an approval of the school board minutes from the meet regular meeting on Tuesday, February 10th. So if I could have a motion to approve those. So moved. Thank you, Linda. Anybody second? Mary, thank you. Any comments, questions, <coughs> suggestions, or corrections? Okay, all those in favor? Seven, zero, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and we have no high school reps. Jeff, do you have any comments or no? You don't have to, I just want to. Um, these are really in the nature of recognitions more than anything else. Uh, well, first of all, we are beginning the course selection process. Um, that'll be, we'll be working on that over the next few weeks with students and parents. Um, so that's always an interesting time and it sort of informs some of the budget decisions that can get made as well. And it's, it always is a fascinating puzzle to try to solve, uh, to try to figure out how to make things work for most kids. Um, I just want to offer congratulations to the girls' swim team for winning the state championship, Class A division. Um, 
Actually, I was just told today that Nora Daly has been selected as the outstanding girl swimmer in the state of Maine as well, um, which I think is fabulous. <laughs> Did you know that, Joan? Oh, <laughs> yes, you did. Um, the congratulations, obviously, to the boys' basketball team for winning the Western Maine Regional for the second year in a row. Uh, they fell short in the state championship against a very powerful team. Um, they also won the Sportsmanship Award, which we're very proud of uh, for that accomplishment. Um, and I also want to comment on, we had an unbelievable turnout of Cape Elizabeth community at the state championship game. There had to be 2,000 at least Cape, Cape people, and it was really exciting. And I also want to say that our kids were fabulous. They were spirited, they were loud, and they were positive. Um, they were really good. Um, and competing at sort of a lesser level, a little bit more under the, under the radar, and hopefully we'll be able to give you the final results in a few weeks, but our science team is right now in first place in the uh, North Shore Science League competition in Massachusetts, so we're very excited about that. Thank you, Jeff, on behalf of the high school students. Um, comments from the public on non-agenda items. So anyone who wishes to speak to something that's not on the agenda, okay? Um, recognition, Jeff, I should have just had you stay right there. Um, got a couple items from the high school. Um, the first is we had a group of students um, who went down to Boston University for uh, a Model UN competition. Um, a thousand, over a thousand students from across New England and the Atlantic region converged on Boston uh, at this Model UN. And the kids did very well, and for the first time ever, Rachel Muscat, um, one of our seniors who was participating, whose role was she was on the USSR Council of Ministers, and she won a best delegate uh, recognition which is the first time anybody from Cape has. Um, it's, a, it's the highest award for individual performance that students can get. So that's fabulous for that number of students competing. Um, and John Aronson, um, also a senior, won an outstanding delegate award, which is also a tremendous accomplishment with that field of students. The World Affairs Council Model UN has really flourished at the high school. It's just a fabulous, fabulous program. Um, it really opens students um, minds um, to be good global citizens and aware of things that are going on. Um, those same two students uh, that I mentioned are two of our four students who are presidential scholar nominees. Um, that's John Aronson and Rachel Muscat. Um, and presidential scholars are nominated by a mysterious process that takes into account SAT scores and AP scores and a whole bunch of academic sort of measures. Um, and all, but also extracurricular involvement, community involvement, and, and those sorts of things. And it's a really huge honor to be nominated. It's a very uh, extremely competitive process to go beyond that process. And there's a, there's a lot of work that goes into actually completing the application that Presidential Scholar requires. Uh, the other two, besides John Aronson and Rachel Muscat, are, are Caitlin Pomeroy and Michael Tainter. So congratulations to all of those, those four students. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Actually, to put you on the spot one more time, um, do you have any idea? I, I was going to um, put in recognition for the theater group that are participating in the one act, because if anyone hasn't gone, I would encourage them to go. It's a great performance. Do you have any idea how they did? They were competing last Saturday. They the won their festival. regional, and they're going on to the state drama festival, which I think is two weekends from now. Right. And there will be several, is it two weekends or one? It's not this weekend, yeah, it's the following weekend. Um, and there will be a number of performances next week, so stay tuned for those. And I would second what Trip yeah. says, it's well worthwhile going to see it if you haven't had the opportunity yet. It's just really, really well done. Thank you, Jeff. I promise I'll give you a break now. Um, Steve, middle school letters about literature. This is, a, uh, this is information from Jamie Michaud about letters, regarding letters about literature. It's a writing contest. It's a national writing contest for students in grades four through 12. It's sponsored by the Center for the Book in the, Lib Center for the, Book in the Library of Congress in partnership with Target. The 
purpose of the contest is to promote reading and writing. The contest prompt is the same every year. Select a fiction or non-fiction book, a short story, a poem, an essay, or a speech you have read, and about which you have strong feelings. Write a letter to the author explaining how this piece of literature affected you. There, this year there were 54,000 students nationwide who entered the contest, and uh, after the first two rounds of judging, 49,000 of those entries were eliminated. The remaining 5,000 entries included 13 of Janie's students from the middle school uh, in the eighth grade. She had uh, 30, I think it was like 37 students submit papers to that, and 13 are in the final 10%. These 5,000 entries have been sent to the students' home states where literacy organizations complete another round of judging to determine state winners. In Maine, the Maine Humanities Council is in charge of judging. Winners in each state will then be part of a fourth round of judging to determine national winners. I am currently waiting to hear if any of my 13 students is a semifinalist or winner for the state of Maine. Um, we should know the results. Uh, she should get an email tonight. I have required my students to enter this contest for the past two years. I learned about this contest at a professional development workshop given by the uh, literacy expert Nancy Atwell, amazing author for middle school literacy. And Jamie was able to attend that workshop in 2007 thanks to professional development funds. I think she put a plug in there. Among many other things, Nancy taught me how to be a good uh, writing, how to determine a good writing contest from a scam, and, how, and showed her that writing contests can be very motivating to student writers. Um, here are the names of this. I promise. She said, "You got I promise my kids you'd read this tonight." So, okay, I'll read it. So, uh, the uh, 13 students are Griffin Carpenter for his piece on "One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest," Megan Clifford for "Night," Jane Coffin, "The Book Thief." Alex Cooley, A Long Way Gone, Emma Dadman, The Kite Runner, Clarice Diebold, My Sister's Keeper, Hannah Deneen, My Sister's Keeper, Daniel Epstein, The Book of Joby, Michaela Ford, Knight, Courtney Garrett, Beyond Basketball, Emma Inhorn, Ink Spell, Katie McDonald, That Summer, and Laura Mackay, The Girls. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, moving on to communications, athletics update. Jeff? Good evening. And uh, Mr. Shed kind of ele <laughs> stole my thunder here a little bit, but uh, um, I will, as I, I did. light on it. Yeah. It's all good, it's all good news though, so. Um, I will, uh, again, pr put together sort of a uh, season summary and then um, put that out to the community and to the school board as well, which kind of sums up some of our individual and team accomplishments uh, this winter. And it was a very busy yet uh, very successful winter. And um, we are now moving on to spring, trying to finalize schedules. And um, that everything now is on the uh, Cape Elizabeth webpage and um, up to date. And hopefully the snow will melt and we'll be on the fields as soon as possible. But uh, so I figured since uh, we sort of talk, touched on the um, winter accomplishments, maybe just give a brief update where we are with Sports Sunrise. So um, we, th we have had several small group meetings uh, throughout the year and just recently met twice uh, with, a, with a leadership team for Sports Sunrise uh, in January and February and really kind of finalized uh, our action plan. And in that action plan, what we're trying to do is identify areas of commendation and then areas of recommendation and then how to um, and come up with a plan on how to uh, address the areas that we need to improve on and, and once we have that set, which should be hopefully by the end of this week, we'll submit our books to the Sports Sign Right group in, in, in Bangor in Orna, at Orno and from there we will uh, hopefully have an accreditation committee come down and meet with some of the coaches, some of the parents, some of the fac uh, uh, students, and uh, school board members as well. We haven't learned of all the, uh, the fine details yet, but that will come soon and we'll get that information out to everyone. And, um, so they'll speak and meet and based on their conversations and based on our book, um, our Sports and Right book for Cape Elizabeth, they will uh, hopefully 
approve us and uh, we can start that process for the 09-10 school year. And from that point, it's a really a matter of educating um, uh, our high school, middle school, community service programs, some of our outside uh, travel team programs and just getting that information out and getting the community to uh, sort of understand. Again, we've, we've introduced it, but I think coming back to it and really kind of understanding what uh, sports done right is all about and, and making it a community concept. So um, that's exciting news. We're really looking forward to that and I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved. It's, we've had some really good, uh, really good discussions and uh, I think it's going to be a, a really positive piece for um, the athletic programs in the community. So that's where we are with Sports Done Right and, um, and we're also meeting, uh, hoping to set up another booster meeting uh, this month and kind of review where we are with the athletic budget and uh, for next year or at least give them a rough idea as to what we're expecting um, and um, just again you know communicate on I think understanding the economic times that we're in looking at ways where we can better spend and better utilize our our funds so that should be occurring hopefully soon at the end of the month and um, like I said I will provide everyone with a uh, season summary for the winter sports and um, that's about it. Thank you. Any questions for Jeff? Before you? Thank you, Jeff. Um, Alan, middle school in yes. Pond Cove, family leave requests. I just suddenly realized as I looked at these that one of them is requesting an extended leave of absence and that's Nicole Ball. So I'm going to hold hers until we get down to the path that I also do about Karen Lamb. So the one that I will do right now is for Kim uh, Uckel. Uh, she's submitting her request for maternity leave beginning sometime uh, around in uh, April. And she, by what she calculates right now, she'd be out to six, eight weeks, but is not requesting any extension. So I only present this to you tonight for information, so you'll be aware of that, that we will be having someone covering her class uh, once she delivers or when she delivers or before she delivers until the end of the year. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, retirement of middle school staff. Yes. And that middle school staff person is here. Yes. And so I would like to read her letter. Uh, this is from Julie Salikas. In a letter she wrote, while cleaning out some files a few weeks ago, I found a letter of welcome from Ron Reynolds, the superintendent who hired me 36 years ago. It prompted me to reflect over my career here, which has been the greater part of my professional life. I am thankful for the opportunity that I've had. My colleagues are the best, and the students I have worked with have always been a treasure to me. I have, one, I have wonderful memories. The time has come for me to take my leave, effective at the end of the current 08-09 school year. I thank you and the school board for the privilege of serving as a school nurse for the Cape Elizabeth community. Uh, I present this with great regret, but also wish her well. As I've said to her before, she'll feel 20 years younger <laughs> next week after she's retired. So congratulations, Julie. Does anyone, anyone have a comment? Because I do, if no one else does. I just want to say, Julie, that my children, all three of them, and I will miss you greatly. And I'm sure that I'm speaking for many of the parents in the community. So thank you for always being there um, and going above and beyond. Yes. And I, I feel cheated. <laughs> you should. Yes. Julie, I don't want to put you on the spot, but also I would like to, if you would like to say something, you're welcome to. You do not have to. I saw the no. OK, thank you. <laughs> Um, re resignation of Pond Cove Health Educator. Yes, this has been an interesting one. <laughs> uh, Gina Rossi, who has been a half-time health educator at Pond Cove for three, is this the third year? <laughs> yep. uh, I, I had a contact from the Portland School System a while ago saying that she was a candidate for a full-time position there. That word full-time position meant something to me because I knew by the looks of the budget, she would not be full-time here for a long time. And so I really had to consider that. So I called Tom and talked with him, and we both agreed that although we hate to lose Gina because she is such a positive influence at Pond Cove, we have to look at it from a professional point of view too. 
And so I did grant her the opportunity to go to Portland, and we are in the process right now of, of replacing her at Pond Cove. So what she has written here is, I would like to inform you that I am resigning from my position as Pond Cove Health Educator for the Cape Elizabeth School System. Thank you for the professional and personal development you have assisted me with over the last four years. Okay. I consider everyone I have met here to be a friend of mine, and I will miss you all. However, I have been presented an opportunity to teach in the school system as a full-time health educator. In these financially difficult times, it is in my best interest to create a more stable situation for my family and myself. For these reasons, I feel it is time to move on to different opportunities and challenges. Uh, and so uh, I did, I talked with her for a long time, I talked with Tom, uh, I talked with people in Portland, and I have released her so that she can go over there to teach health uh, full time at the middle school. Any questions or comments for Alan? Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, the last item is a quick recap of the February 25th meeting that was held here at Town Hall um, with the local legislators and um, school board members from Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, and Scarborough. Um, there's a great summary of that meeting in the Cape Courier, so I'm not gonna, I will refer people to that. I'm not gonna take up too much time, but um, Jim Rowe, the town council chair, arranged that meeting. We want to thank him for that. And it was really to provide an opportunity for um, the people in attendance to sort of talk, have some dialogue, to exchange ideas, and how the three communities might consider collaboration in a number of areas. Um, we left it, some of the follow-up items, it is still a little bit unclear where the, whether there's continued interest in having these again. It did seem like there was. There were two items of follow-up, and I think I spoke with Jim a little bit. He was wondering um, if the school board, and he suggested you, Alan, <laughs> um, could identify, and you've been doing it anyway, but also I would turn to Rebecca and Mary, because you guys have been doing a good job, to identify someone who would sort of provide public, um, the public with information, as well as the school board and town council with updates on the stimulus package as they become available. Um, and also, the other thing, he is sort of waiting to see if there are any of the collaborative ideas that came, um, were discussed, if, if we're going to continue in these types of meetings, and if there was a small group that was formed to sort of represent the school board. Um, is there anyone, and again, this is sort of vague, and I don't need an answer tonight, but if there's anyone who's interested in serving on that small group or sort of working, if a group gets formed, um, in doing that to... Let me know. And there are other people, a lot of people who are at that meeting. So if anyone, I'd open the floor to anyone who might want to comment on impressions or thoughts from that meeting. OK, um, moving on. We were entering into new business. The first item of business is consideration um, and action to adopt the superintendent's budget. I know that's what I was going to say. So, um, and we had earlier in the evening said that we would allow public comment. So, um, anyone who wishes to speak um, can approach the podium. Please identify yourself. And we are, I will comment ahead of time. I apologize if it appears rude, but we are going to limit people um, so that we can wrap up public comment no, sometime between. 20 of and quarter of eight. So if you could keep your comments brief, it would be appreciated. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julie Salikas, a school nurse in the middle school. Um, and I want to thank you for your kind words. But I'm really here to speak about cuts of EdTech one, one, Ones. Um, I'd like to share a letter I wrote to Steve Colley and Superintendent Hawkins about Sherry Gillis, Gillies, whose position as Ed Tech One was cut in the first round. It was suggested to me that I share this letter with the board and the community at large so that people understand the importance of these positions. <clears throat> I know it could be said of any of the other Ed Techs whose positions are also being cut. As many others have already done, I would like to share some thoughts about my colleague Sherry Gillies. Sherry wears many hats in our building, and she wears them all very well. As a hardworking ed tech, she helps the grade level teams in preparing daily classroom materials. 
whether it is a last minute request or a long term project, she is always efficient and prepared. If a teacher becomes ill or a family member becomes ill, has a doctor's appointment or must attend an IEP, Sherry is more than willing to cover a class. She does what is asked of her and she does it with a smile. Sherry covers the main office when there is a need and she greets the public with kindness and respect. Parents and students find her to be engaging and most helpful. If I am in a health class or attending a meeting, Sherry will gladly cover the health office. She is caring and thoughtful in meeting the needs of students and she is a quick thinker and uses excellent judgment. She is not afraid to ask questions and she always completes her work. She is one of the few ed techs system-wide who has completed a state-mandated training in first aid and medication administration. She is also CPR and AED certified, which is incredibly important today in our school. Sherry Gillies is one of those people in the middle school who is part of the glue that holds us together. She seldom misses a day of work. She serves as a community team facilitator and often helps to organize those events. She volunteers to attend Chewankee, she chaperones the dances, and she has opened her home and heart for faculty and staff gatherings. Teachers often stop by her office for friendly chats, for treats to be found in her desk drawer, and for good laughs and cries. She does the calling for subs early in the morning, and I can assure you, if you don't have ed techs to help teachers next year, you will be needing many more substitutes. Sherry Gillies is a talented, intelligent, caring human being who works much harder than the salary she receives. I hope that, as you reflect over the budget during this very difficult time, you realize the value of these positions. More importantly, though, consider the person who presently holds that, that position. Sherry Gillies is a tremendous asset to the middle school as are all of the other EdTech ones. Thank you for allowing me to share your thoughts. Thank you, Julie. Uh, David Hillman of Cranbrook Drive. Uh, has everybody in school had a chance to read my short seven page comments? Because I won't repeat them. Um, I want to clarify something that apparently has come up. Uh, I know that suggestions have been made to the school board that they ought to consider consolidating uh, Pond Cove and Middle School into a K-8 school. Um, and somewhat piggybacking on my comments about how it should be what we call in the legal community administrative sharing, administrative consolidation of secretarial and clerical staff. It's actually two completely different things. I was not in any way suggesting you combine two schools. Combining two schools, Pond Cove Middle School, would be a disaster. One. It would have terrible consequences for the town that the, I don't believe these people realize. Secondly, it won't work. It won't save money. It'll actually cost money. And third, it won't work because you can't combine um, the teaching and education and safety and the needs of a first grader with an adolescent. I mean, they're two different worlds, two different groups of people. The terrible result for the town is simply that we lose our exemption from the school consolidation law. You need at least three schools. If you go to two schools, you automatically lose your exemption. That would be a horrendous result. We would then be combined with South Portland, which is losing or maybe losing a certification and have significantly higher education costs than we do. But we would lose our school exemption if we went to two schools. That alone should kill it. But secondly, the idea that if you combine two schools, you achieve efficiencies, economies, the scale, synergies, all that sort of stuff, it doesn't work. That was all done in the 70s and 80s with corporations combining. They all found it didn't work. It's a very, didn't work, and it actually cost some money. They found it didn't work for a very simple reason. If you have two companies with equally efficient administration, you have 10 people administration, 50 workers. Company B has 10 people administration, efficiently working, 50, 500 workers. You combine the two, you get 1,000 workers. You still need 20 people. I mean, just because you become one thing, you can't cut out half of them. So it just doesn't work, and it's been shown for 20 years now it doesn't work. Uh, so I want to clarify that. Um, I will not repeat the points made in my, um, since you all nodded at least 10 in you had read it, um, I, I would note a couple of comments. I, I'm disappointed that my suggestion about determining efficiencies doesn't appear to have been examined. 
And that is, I'm sorry if I, uh, doesn't appear to have been examined. I, I suggested that strongly the secretarial clerical Xerox and that all three schools they administrate in a superintendent's office be looked at to consolidate. And I mean on an administrative basis. And also, maybe the superintendent in the town. It doesn't look like there's any administrative cuts, all educational cuts still, although some has been put back in. I strongly suggest that you take a look at it. I, I believe, but I do not know, that there is savings that can be made there. And I would like that savings to be put into education, which ultimately leads to tax savings. Um, I also think, and I wanted to reemphasize one point made in mind, there is still some significant underfunding, even though you put money back into the budget, which I applaud. Um, the nature of the beast, the way we do our budget system, is we compare budget in year two to year one, and that necessarily doesn't pick up underfunding that occurred in year one because it wasn't included in the budget. I, I calculate at least 600000 of what we need for textbooks, uh, replacement computers, and, and tech support, never mind all the things we've done for technology, that we put in 50000 for. That leaves at least, in my mind, $550,000 short. Hopefully we can get some money from the stimulus for that, but um, with the other $400,000 in cuts, that means our budget's about a million dollars short. I know the political realities you have to live with, but I want people to understand, especially the public, that this budget, a 1.93% budget, which is only 77 cents per household, which translates to about four cents a day, is a de minimis impact on the household, especially when you get an $800 stimulus money from the federal government. But it has massive impact on our schools, because that's hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that we're short. And I think we're going to have to make it up and make it up fairly soon. Thank you. Thank you, David. Hi, my name is Chris Bolsa O'Meara. I'm the Library Media Specialist at Pond Cove School. Um, and I really feel like I just need to come and talk about um, the EdTech One positions, especially as it pertains to the Media Center at Pond Cove School. We are a teaching library um, with a fairly full schedule of students all day long. Um, while I am actually teaching the class, teaching kids how to find books, how to use a call number, what it means, all those kinds of things, doing research using indexes, um, ed tech staff in the library tends to everybody else who walks into the media center while I'm teaching. Um, so teachers that come in looking for materials, other students that come in looking for things, maybe they were out the day before, maybe they forgot their library books. Um, she, she attends to those needs of those students and teachers. Um, I think that cutting the position of the ed tech one in the media center will greatly affect my ability to make that position a teaching position. If it's not going to be a teaching position, then I think you're really not following best practices and the data that supports the current staffing that we have in the libraries in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I know I sent you letters um, citing that um, information. Um, and there is, there's a real correlation between having funded libraries that help students expand their horizons and explore interests that pertain to them. That's something they don't have time to do in the classroom. If you take away that teaching element and that support, it's going to have a, a trickle-down effect that you probably won't see right away. Um, but I think you really have to think hard about going down that road. And if it's a road you truly indeed want to go down, then there are, are much, there are better ways and you can cut much more money. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Susan Dana. I teach Spanish at the middle school. I'm also a resident of um, Cape Elizabeth, but I'm here tonight speaking as a teacher. Um, I'm just, I would just like to, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for everything that you do. I, I realize that you're all volunteers, and I appreciate all that you do. And I realize that this is a really tough economic time. Um, I just really want to address the ed techs. The World Language Team didn't send a letter to Steve Conley, our principal, and to Alan Hawkins, but I just have to come up and have, have this just put on the record. And I realize that, that things are going to have to be cut, but... Um, I just want to explain what, what an ed tech does for us aside from photocopying. I mean, that is one thing. The demands on the teachers in the past five or ten years have really increased with, with email. I'm just thinking of, of emails today, three parent emails. It took me 45 minutes just to respond to three emails because I, I had to do some research. I wanted to write it well. And, um, so that's, that's my planning period, 45 minutes, is responding to three emails. We probably get 25 to 50 emails a day. Some are just internal, which are really quick. But um, so that's one thing that just having an ed tech to do some photocopying frees up that time. 
Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the photocopying because I'd like to go into more details how they really support student learning. Um, one example, just I, I happened to do it today, so I just went a little bit later. I ran off to school, but Bank they bought us, which is 20 cows, um, which is a game that I played. These were laminated by an ed tech. I've got 60 cows here, um, and it's one of those things. It's this great game. I went from a listserv, again, spending a lot of time in professional development on my own, and I read about it four years ago. I said, well, let me give this a try in class. And, um, it's just a really simple game. So bank they bought us. You've got the alliteration, 20 cows. It takes 20 seconds. It's a team has, or two, two teams. We just did a review today with vocabulary. I had students, I had the really popular students, where the students weren't quite as popular, the high achievers, or the lower achievers, working as a group collaboratively. They were so excited to win 20 cows. The first team that wins 20 cows is a champion. Um, so it sounds really simple, but I probably wouldn't play this game without ed techs because I don't have time to make 60 cows. And I did find the clip art, it took about an hour because I had a clip art with a cow that looked appropriate. Some cows are really appropriate, so. But they laminated, so this is one. I'd be really careful in middle school that you've got appropriate looking cows. But, um, and I can just go on and on and on in terms of the materials that they've developed. But the World Language Team, all of our materials are teacher generated in grades three through six. And then also in grades seven and eight, uh, a lot of it is teacher generated. In part, the textbooks are old, and I realize there's going to be funding for textbooks. But aside from that, a language is so dynamic that I'm just we're constantly coming up with new things. And this is an example of one that an, an ed tech that would do. Another um, important thing, it sounds very small, it's almost an intangible, it's hard to describe. But it's just in terms of the climate. If I know, for example, when my children were younger and I wanted to catch like the last 15 minutes of performance at Pond Cove, or even if I were in South Portland or Falmouth, an ed tech could come cover my class for just those last 15 or 20 minutes. I probably wouldn't bother to submit for a personal day or a sub for something like that. But that really is a climate and the professional, the feel for how we're supported. And I do feel that we are supported in the system, but I just, it's, it's from a good feeling to an excellent feeling. The same thing with student learning from good learning to excellent learning. And I think Cape prides itself on being an excellent school system. And I just see over the past, having taught here for 18 years, two children went through the system, just an erosion little by little by little. Um, and not, again, not reflects of this board, but over, over time. Um, and these are just little things that are, they're intangible, but we're losing these. I can put up with the building being cold, the students know to wear sweaters this year. Those types of things are fine. I realize that, that we have to do that. But, this is, and it's hard for me to describe this because it is, is just the intangible. Um, I don't want to take too much more time, but the other thing, I mean, I could, the other thing, I really do not like to get subs, and I think many teachers feel this way, because if I get a sub to come in to cover for class, if I have a dentist appointment, sometimes you can only get one at 1.30 in the afternoon. I could take a medical day, the district is going to have to pay for a sub for the afternoon. But also, when I have a sub in a language, I rarely, rarely do I have a sub who knows the language, so I'm really leaving busy work for the students, whereas if I can at least get my students started, and maybe the last 15 minutes of that class I can do their homework, and then an ed tech will come in to cover, I, it really benefits student learning. I think all of, of the bottom line is how is this benefiting student learning, and I really think those ed techs support us that way. Um, so I guess I'm just going to stop here, but I really, um, I also headed the, the climate committee district-wide K through 12 for three or four years. And I just, this probably hits me more in terms of climate. Um, well, climate and also student learning. So I'll just leave it at that. I just want to go on record if we ever get money from surplus or whatever. I want that. So, thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think we probably have uh, maybe three to four more minutes if there's anyone else who would like to speak. OK. Um, thank you to all who spoke. Um, Alan, I'm wondering, um, the first item is consideration and adoption of your budget. If you'd like to give us a quick overview of where sure. we were from the last workshop. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. As you remember, we met last Friday uh, as a finance committee, and I did go over the, the latest uh, rendition of the alternatives for this uh, budget. I want to be very clear as I talk about it is that uh, we start budget early in the fall with information that is not clear, some information is not there, even information today that's not there. For instance, GPA, we still don't know exactly where that's going to be. We look at it very carefully from all aspects of the school department. I'm very clear. I remember four years ago when I first came here and I made a presentation on the budget. I made the statement that with what has been happening in this town with school budgets, we are getting back into a corner. Many people laughed at that. Uh, I don't think as many people laugh at it today because we are backed into a corner. 
No matter what decisions we make, there are popular sides of it and there are unpopular sides of it. Uh, I was struck, if I can just comment it for a minute to go with this, is David Hillman's comment about administration. I will remind people that last year we cut over $80,000 worth of administration when we cut the uh, curriculum director. We also cut Shari's position at that point in time, which was to support student learning. Those were both administrative positions that were very important to us, but we could no longer afford them. So today, my administrators are the ones who are doing all of that work and have added more time already to a very, very heavy schedule to do that. So when we look at secretaries and people who work in the buildings, I have to look at it from the perspective of what are the demands that are put on them. I'm also very clear, as I've worked on, worked on this budget, that we are coming into a different era where for next year we are going to look at every component of our budget. That will be from the superintendent right straight through to every person in the system. What is the effect, the positive effect of learning in every person who works in the system? And I feel very strongly that bus drivers, food service operators, all of those people, maintenance people, all play an important role in how our schools operate so that we don't have ceilings falling down, so that we have reasonable cleanliness, so that we have food available, we have teachers, we have ed techs, we have administrators, et cetera. We will be looking at every single component this coming year. But I would say to you that it is very easy to forget what has been done when you're looking at the moment and what you want to see. What I did was uh, I took a look at the work that the uh, school board did this year in setting goals. And they did that in December. And one extremely important goal that they put in front of us was technology. Because we have not, we have had a lot of work done on technology in the past, but we still have not reached the 21st century and what needs to happen there. So I was very pleased to see the board truly focus on technology and the needs of technology in our school system. With that, it also opens the door for using data in order to understand what we're doing, what successes we have. It also opens the door of our curriculum, <coughs> instruction, and assessment. So what I saw immediately was we now have several connections together that are very important connections. We are developing curriculum. We are looking at instruction and how that works to ensure that students are getting the best education they can. We look at assessing their learning. We look at gathering data to understand what we know about what they're learning. And we use technology along with other resources, including textbooks, which I've heard a lot about in the last three years, in order to ensure that we have all the pieces to the puzzle. And we do this on a limited budget, a budget that gets smaller every year, this year, we have certainly been attacked in 09 with the curtailment, which was just recently set aside because of the supplemental budget. We've also had that. We thought it was going to be in 10 and 11. It's our understanding now that the governor will not be doing that. So we, are, we look at a budget that is based on what are the actual spending needs of the system. I can't lay aside the fact that we do start out a budget year every year when we look at salaries and fringe benefits, and we start out with a $1.1 million need for the system. There's no question about that. We chose a few years, uh, two years ago not to go into a consolidated program. So we are a school system that stands on its own, that continues to spend less than most systems our size across the state, and we continue to do the best job we can with what we have. So in looking at that, what I did for this time is that number one, I looked at technology as having a greater importance because of the goals of the board, but also my belief that technology plays an important part with curriculum, instruction, assessment, and data. So in doing that, what we did is we re-looked at the budget one more time. We also knew there's some different monies here. We knew that we were getting, we had originally uh, put in the budget 20% for insurance, health insurance, because that is a contracted agreement. Most systems in the state, when you are looking at a, a health insurance, you do not know what it's going to be yet. 
you normally build it to 80 to 20 percent to be sure that you are well prepared. Two weeks ago, I heard from uh, many people in the state that it looked like it was going to be less than 10 percent. Uh, as of Thursday, we'll know exactly what it's going to be. But at that point in time, we dropped the insurance from 10 uh, 20 percent to 10 percent, which then allowed me to take a look at the changing picture. Uh, so I have here, uh, which Trish will pass out, kind of the overview of where we are right now with staffing and what it looks like. Now, I would love to do all things for all people at all times, but unfortunately I can't manage that with the, the money we have unless I begin to look at what we're doing and not feel that we can move ahead. So what you'll find here is we do have some staffing cuts. Some of the staffing cuts will be based on uh, population. For instance, we have a second grade teacher who is cut at Pond Cove. That teacher would have been cut if we had a 10% budget or a 5% budget or a 0% budget because numbers are dropping. There's no question about that. We were able to cut uh, some stipended positions. We were able to look at some other programs. Uh, we began at the same time to build in what we felt were the needs for technology and how we would manage that. We looked at the money that's available through the uh, stimulus package from the uh, president. We still do not have the exact formula. It has not been, we heard, I heard today again, in the legislature, they're still working out that bottom line. But we're hoping we can use some of that stimul stimulus money, not for long-term savings, a long-term change, because it's only 15 months <coughs> money but looking for that to lead some of the work we want to do in technology, some of the work we want to do around executive skills. Uh, we looked at some positions we had cut, and we decided when we look at the full picture, K through 12, we needed to bring some of those back. And so we have shown some of those on this, in this package. What has really happened is we have, in total, have a cut of $194,597. Now, when you stop and think that we started out with a $1.1 million shortfall, and you look at how we have arranged, rearranged money, $194,597 is not good, but it's better than $1.1 million. And so that's where we have ended up. Now, we can debate for days on end, or weeks on end, or months on end, what is right and what is wrong. Uh, I've heard people tonight, and I've heard people before say, well, I could tell you better ways to do this. Everyone has a better way to do this as long as it's not in their backyard. So we have worked as hard as we possibly can, hours after hours, trying to resolve this budget process for this year to make it look like and make it be a process that will work. Uh, I want to thank my administrators who have spent many, many, many grueling hours with me as we've gone through this discussed it, argued it, and come back around and around and around again to see where we are. I want to thank the board for their patience. You get from me a superintendent's budget that is based on what information we have and what information we have to work with. And it is frustrating, I know, for you also. But hopefully we are coming up with a new plan so that in a fiscal year 11 we'll have a very different way of looking at this. But basically what I would say to you is with the savings that we were able to get, first from fuel oil, secondly from diesel fuel, thirdly from health insurance, uh, hopefully by not getting the curtailment enough money of unex unexpended funds to make sure we have the revenue that we need to have, we have been able to come to a point where we are showing an increase of 0.77 percent which had previously been a 4.03% increase. As of uh, Monday, Monday, yes, Monday, we heard from the town manager that based on the statistics we have right now, we have a 0% tax increase for the town. Now, we have increased spending, but because of all of the different ways we have been able to realign money as we learn it's there, this is not a trick, it's not something I've been hiding, but as we learn what we have, we have learned that we are able to make that money work for us, which I'm very pleased to see. So what you have, and I think some of you picked it up down back, you have a two-page letter from me, which briefly summarizes this new uh, alignment of the budget. You also have the budget realignment sheet, 
which talks about some of the things that we have done. And then, you, then we have a newer sheet which kind of looks at the whole package. And so that's what I had that I talked with the board about on Friday in their finance committee meeting. And that is the piece that we would discuss tonight as far as where we are going to go from there. Mm -hmm. Hopefully to come to a point where we can make a decision on a fiscal year uh, 10 <coughs> budget. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, do I have a motion at all? I'll make the motion um, based on the Finance Committee's recommendation to the school board of last Friday. I move that we accept the superintendent's proposed budget for 2009-2010 of 1.93 percent above the 2008-2009 budget. This includes a revenue increase of 3.41 percent. Uh, local property tax of 1.61 percent increase and mills raised for education of 0.77 percent i'll also note that for a medium median home in cape elizabeth valued at 252,500 dollars this would um, represent a 24 dollar and 14 cent tax increase on an annual basis Thank you, Kathy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm sure there are comments, questions. Anyone want to start? Mary? Start. Okay. Um, I will be supporting the superintendent's budget tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank the superintendent and the rest of the DLT for the many hours that they put into this. Uh, those of you who have been following this process recognize that we've come a long way from where we feared we might be tonight um, in a matter of two months. Um, it's true that we're very lean at this time and every cut is to the bone. Uh, we heard tonight about um, how everyone gets hurt, every cut hurts someone somewhere. But I feel the foundation of a good learning experience starts with quality teachers and dynamic programs. And thanks to the monies from the stimulus package and the adjustments made in benefits for fuel costs, um, then um, we were able to save many teaching positions and programs. In addition, um, support for the district goals around technology will be advanced in each school, and I'm pleased to see at least partial funding for textbooks, which are a critical investment for our students and our schools. Um, of course, there were losses in this bu budget cycle, um, most of which were taken from the smallest piece of the budgetary pie, that which is dedicated to basic education. As I've said before, it's untenable to assume that we can continue to slice away at this piece of the pie without consequence for our system and our community. Though this is my first budget cycle from the inside, I've been watching from the outside pretty closely for about five years. And it occurs to me that without exception, the board has been forewarned that a struggling economy required them to sharpen their pencils and make cuts even when the market was at 13,000. Regardless, pencils were sharpened and programs were cut and parents were required to shoulder more and more of the economic burden for a public education for their children. It's just an unsustainable path. Fortunately today, I don't know how many of you saw this, but the president unveiled his new plan for education. Um, and I think we're probably on the brink of some reform. Locally, what we've seen is the emails have been pouring in and they show a spirit of support for our schools and even some creative ideas for saving tax dollars to rescue teaching positions and educational programming. Um, it's my hope that the tide for education may be turning. However, these are truly extraordinary times and as much as I'd like to have a budget that may be higher, um, we need a budget with a minimal tax impact. It's not only sensible, it's required. And it's the right thing to do. So thanks to the work of the DLT, that's the budget that will be delivered to our town council next week, I assume, or I hope. 
And as a citizen, um, I have to say it's my hope that the council will approve this budget as it stands and send it to the voters um, without alteration. This year especially, we need an uncomplicated budget validation vote so our community can refocus its attention on what's best for, I think, the nation's economic recovery, which is offering a high quality education to its future leaders. It is my opinion that our potential rests in educational achievement and continued investment, which is why I support the budget as it's presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else like to make a comment? Kathy? You calling on me? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it's just easier calling to on me. Okay. Thank you. Um, I didn't prepare a speech for tonight. I didn't last year either um, because I wanted to sort of see how things came out. Um, I consider this budget a compromise budget um, because I supported a lower budget. And I think I've said that a couple times. Um, my concerns continue to be the economy and what's happening out there. Um, and uh, recognizing that the Finance Committee supported um, the recommendation to the board of this budget, I, I validate that. Um, I would like to see us look at budgeting process a little differently next year. Um, in fact, I think maybe it should be an ongoing uh, process because I think we end up being, um, getting to a point where we are sort of scrambling. Um, I think some of us want to hear more about the programs. I think some of us want to hear more about the numbers. I'm one of the people that wants to hear more about the numbers. Um, and so I don't think we necessarily spend enough time doing that. And I'm saying to myself, I don't know that that's um, something that we should save for just the budgeting time, but should do it on an ongoing basis. So um, I also would like to thank the superintendent and the district leadership folks, um, and actually all the staff, because I know we've heard from staff members, but I recognize that we have um, a hardworking staff and they keep the interest of the students um, first and foremost, which is what I try to remind myself always as we get into some of the political discussions and we hear from some folks and we get some good ideas from some of the public folks. But um, I try to remember that it's um, at the risk of sounding like a former school board member, it's about the kids. So for those of us who've been on there for a while, we know who I'm talking about. So. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say. Thank you, Kathy. Anyone else? Want me to go? Karen? Um, I apologize. I'm a little more long-winded, but I think some of you have grown accustomed to it because it takes me time so I don't panic when I speak. I have to prepare what I'm going to say. So I'm going to share with you, and I think I might be able to skip over some of it. So that's the good news. <laughs> Um, okay, pulling together. Yeah, do we need to put a limit on you. Let's <laughs> you might have put a limit on me. <laughs> exactly. Ten minutes. <laughs> um, well, pulling together my thoughts on this year's school budget has been challenging. Uh, on a daily basis, we read about or experience the ramifications of a serious economic recession. Everyone has been impacted in some way. The loss of a job, a foreclosure, a loss of savings and investments, the loss of health insurance, a move back home, and the list goes on. Each of us has been forced to rethink our current economic realities and to make prudent, often difficult, and sometimes extremely, extremely painful decisions. With this backdrop in mind, I have had to repeatedly ask myself, how can we best advocate for our schools? How can we make sure we remain focused on improving student learning and student performance? How can we provide stewardship and positive direction for public education in our community that will adequately prepare our students for the 21st century. I am grateful to be working with the other school board members here tonight who were elected by this community. I believe we all care deeply about our schools and about the people who live in this community. I know I can pick up the phone or have a conversation with any one of them to get a broader perspective or better understand an opinion different from my own. 
I've learned a great deal from them, from the district leadership team, from the faculty and staff, the superintendent, and all the citizens who have cared enough to voice their opinions. Thank you. It is very attempting to get stuck in the box of fighting for what we already have, or fighting to do what we have always done, but to do it a little better, or fighting to hold on to our current notion of excellence, but for less money. But none of these propositions is particularly innovative. None of these truly moves us forward in a significant way educationally, and none of these takes us out of the 20th century way of doing things, placing us squarely into a dynamic global 21st century paradigm that demands a more radical shift in the way we do school. In today's Portland Press Herald, there was an editorial written by Ron Bancroft entitled, Educational Decline is Really Our Biggest Problem. He cited an editorial written several months earlier by David Brooks in the New York Times called The Biggest Issue. Both aptly described the correlation between being a leading economic power and Americans' unparalleled commitment to education, hard work, and economic freedom, or at least what used to be our unparalleled commitment to education in the first half of the 20th century. Our growth in educational progress the second half of the 20th century and leading up into the 21st century has been modest at best and at times has stagnated. Our enormous lead over other developed countries has all but disappeared and many would argue that poor education is threatening our country's long-term prospects. One of the key areas mentioned that we are failing to address in our educational system is knowledge-based skills that are relevant to the 21st century and the global and technological world in which we now live. CAPE is no exception to being stuck in the 20th century way of educating our students. Fortunately, education appears to be making its way once again to the top of the list of national priorities. Our state revenue curtailment has been lifted for this year and next. Additional stimulus funds are in the pipelines to be used towards such things as implementing RTI, training teachers, and supporting technology. The stimulus money, which literally was not part of our budgetary landscape several months ago, has also helped us open the door for more meaningful discussions around where we should be heading as a school district. For those of you who sat through our long and at times frustrating school board workshop two Thursdays ago, I will say to you that that was perhaps one of the most difficult but productive workshops we have had with the district leadership team because of what ultimately resulted and is now reflected in the budget we have before us. Here are some of the items, and I'm not going to go into these in detail because you all know them. And they're available on the website for those of you who don't want to hear them again. Here are some of the items included in this year's budget that I strongly believe are going to move us in the right direction. And I will just do the highlights without the detail. <laughs> The reallocation of resources to give greater support toward technology goals in our district. Um, the reallocation of resources toward targeted or directed staff development that are clearly tied to our district goals and improvement of student learning, specifically movement toward achieving our curriculum, instruction, and assessment goals, and technology goals. And an acknowledgement that teacher leaders are important in achieving curriculum development goals, ultimately enhancing student learning by reinstating part-time teacher leader roles in the middle school. Um, a glimmer of hope that Mandarin might make its way into our curriculum as an introductory course in the high school. Um, money that has finally been set aside to begin a regular systematic approach to managing and purchasing the selections, textbook or technology to support strong curriculum components and also a clearly delineated stimulus spending priority list for our district. Um, there are signs that our federal government understands that the cost of progress cannot all be placed solely on the local taxpayers and an opportunity for our DLT to jumpstart important and innovative work that will lead us where we need to go. I want to thank and commend each person on the district leadership team and our superintendent for listening, for being open-minded and flexible, and for striving to move us forward with student learning and adequate support of the faculty always at the forefront of their thinking. There are two other budget-related items that I would like to address briefly, and I think one of them relates to several of the comments made tonight. Um, first of all, several positions have been cut, and several school employees will need to be laid off. In the current economic climate, I would have liked to have seen the faculty and staff step up to the plate with a willingness to be open to some sacrifice in order to protect their colleagues' jobs. I do not feel good about our sending anyone out in this economy to look for a job. 
Second, while I am pleased with some of the progress I believe we can make with this current budget, I am going forward, I hope going forward, that we will begin to look at the possibilities and opportunities that we are foregoing by self-imposed tax caps, fears of different versions of Tabor, inflexible and short-sighted frugality measures that don't even attempt to grasp at the complexities of educational innovation. These, what I refer to as inflexible and rigid tax-driven measures, are not wise when we can't see the forest for the trees, when we no longer seek a vision of innovation and excellence that is supported by the community, and when cost efficiency becomes more important than recognizing when and where we need to spend to make the necessary investments for long-term viability and true educational excellence. The budget before us tonight calls for a 1.93% increase in school expenditures, and Kathy has already mentioned a 1.61 increase in local property tax and a 0.77% increase in mills raised for education. I believe this is a reasonable and responsible increase and request to ask of our community members. It is important to keep our schools, one of our community's greatest assets and sources of pride, headed in the right direction to begin the work of more strategically positioning ourselves to address the challenges and educational demands of the 21st century to more effectively develop our teachers and prepare our students to compete in a global economy and to more seriously and meaningfully strive for excellence in education. I support the 1.93% budget and hope you will as well. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, anyone else Do you have any comments? Linda and I are both shaking our heads. Nobody wants to go after that. That's right. <laughs> I didn't read all. <laughs> um, I'll do it. <clears throat> um, I couldn't put two sentences together for the past five days, so I'm just going to have to wing it. Um, I will be supporting this budget as presented. Um, when we started this process, I felt nothing but despair with the knowledge that we were going to have, at the very start, a $1.1 million increase as based the um, negotiated contracted salaries and benefits and what that would mean <clears throat> to the budget as a whole in this economic environment. And to say that to, to be looking at a budget at a 1.9% increase with a 0.77% impact on mills raised without having completely devastated our, our schools I think is rather remarkable. And, um, I think we have to give credit to pretty much everybody who has spoken in the past couple of months, and that would be the DLT, citizens, um, staff, and board members. Um, it's quite remarkable. Uh, I also think, Mary, you are correct that a lot of this <clears throat> we owe also to the um, stimulus money and how it has um, rescued us because. Uh, originally a 2% increase in our budget would have resulted in a 4% increase on taxes and I'm not sure we could have um, gotten that through uh, with citizens so I'm very grateful that we have um, this financial support from our federal government and that we will have it going forward at least for another one to two years um, I don't think we prob I don't think we please anybody on this budget. I think um, parents are disappointed that we have cut <clears throat> into the freshman sports. Teachers are obviously going to be very much missing um, the EdTech One support. Um, and I personally will be very much missing the executive skills teacher who I was going to personally rely on for my children. <laughs> Uh, but I'm hopeful that we could perhaps find ways to work that into our regular uh, curriculum um, because I can tell you even at the age of nine, um, executive skills still come into play. So perhaps we could start it at Pond Cove. <laughs> uh, so anyways, I thank everybody for all of their hard work. I'm um, hopeful with this budget that we can make some forward movement. Um, and I. I'm hopeful that all of our citizens could perhaps um, offer their services to our teachers should the EdTech One um, positions have that 
much of an impact on um, the support for our teachers that um, they say. So I will be looking for the postings on um, cable television three for the various um, copying and filing work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Anyone else? <coughs> I'm still finding myself in a pretty difficult position. I walked in here tonight without any type of decision made. I wanted to come this evening to hear what had to be said by any of the members of the public, as well as my fellow board members. And I'm still sitting here finding it to be quite a struggle. I was one of the board members when the initial budget discussion started um, living through the economic times, just like everyone else in this room, seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis, the effects that it's having not only in our community, in our state, but literally nationwide. It's been a tremendous struggle for me to look at this, and unfortunately, I'm another person looking at the bottom line. I know that when we talk about education, we're talking that it's a people business. It affects um, not only the staff members, it affects the students, it affects everybody in this community. Um, and every, every part of that does have a person attached to it. So it is very difficult for me as well to make that separation between the people business that we're in and the bottom line dollar that we must eventually reach. Um, as I said, I came in here tonight without my decision made. I do believe that the efforts that have been put forth by the superintendent, the DLT, all of the all of the staff members in the schools because I know that our DLT has sought for their input. I do applaud all of these members for their innovative and collaborative thinking or obviously we wouldn't have been able to reach the point that we're at. I do truly believe that this is a compromise budget that's being offered here tonight. Um, at this point in time, I am leaning towards approving the recommendation by the uh, Finance Committee, but I must tell you it has been a struggle throughout this whole budget season. I am going to say that with the caveat that I hope to see more innovative and collaborative thinking on the part of all of the staff members here uh, within the school district so that we can make sure that whatever the bottom line does come out to be uh, after the vote is sent to the public that we can continue to draw on the expertise of all of our staff members, especially our superintendent and DLT, to make sure that the monies that they do receive are spent um, to the best of their abilities and to make sure that we are maintaining, if not pushing forward, <clears throat> the educational programming and services that we're offering our students. And thank you again to all of you. Thank you, Linda. Peter, do you Madam Chair, I'm ready to vote. Okay, um, any other comments? No. Um, okay, I will go last. Um, I wanna echo the thanks to the administrative team and the staff, and I also wanna to respond to Kathy's comments about the budget process. I think, there is some, I think there's some impetus and effort that will go into sort of revamping that. I will be this supporting this budget um, the superintendent's budget is I think it represents a reasonable compromise between the level of resources I believe the schools truly need, which would exceed a 2% increase in expenditures, and the level of resources which seems to be available in the current economic climate. There are few investments today which are yielding positive returns. I think public education is the exception to that rule. The students we are educating now will be the ones who will be the decision makers, the financiers, the investors, those funding our retirements 10 to 20 years hence. Investment in education positively correlates with the nation's economic growth, as Karen has mentioned. There is also ample evidence to tie strong public education systems with elevated residential properties, values, and safer communities. In our budget this year, as in the past several years, we have made trade-offs in order to maintain the integrity of our system. I think we are straddling a very fine line between cost savings and shortchanging our students and their families, who increasingly pick up the tab for items that the schools no longer pay for. In the combined budgets for this year and last, there will be a reduction of 3.8 teachers, seven ed techs, one curriculum coordinator, several high school coaches, 
There has been a conversion to pay-to-play athletics at the middle school, elimination of all funding for the outdoor experiential learning programs at the middle school, closure of the high school MAC lab, and withdrawal from the Project Blueprint, a strategy and information sharing group of high-performing school districts. Some of these cuts have been made in response to declining enrollments, as been so often pointed out to us, but that explanation simplifies the situation. The needs of the students that we do serve have changed, and we are operating in an environment of increasing demands. Our system has far more students today who require medical support and intervention at school. We have state and federal mandates for nutrition and wellness. We have additional requirements for crisis management and emergency planning. We have mandated testing and reporting, and perhaps new graduation requirements, as you can believe what was reported in the Portland Press Herald today. We are preparing students for a more competitive college application process, in fact, the most competitive since public, higher education has sort of come into being, and a more complicated global workplace. We have attempted to keep up with changing technology and to minimize threats of litigation, particularly around special education. There have been some thought-provoking ideas which have arisen during the budget process this year, and for that I would like to thank the public. Consideration should be given to these suggestions, not only with potential efficiencies and cost savings in mind, but also within the context of the school's mission, which is to ensure that all of our students develop the knowledge, skills, behaviors, and attitudes to become successful individuals and citizens. I ran across a quote the other day from Jack Welch, the former General Electric CEO and now current MIT Sloan professor that I thought was kind of interesting. He said, this is a time for us to stand up and get out and do something about the country. We have to think about tomorrow, the good tomorrow, the great tomorrow, and not be hunkered down under a rock sucking our thumbs. I think this budget prevents us from sucking our thumbs and maybe pushes our toe out from underneath the rock. Investing in our schools is one way to start to move forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor of the motion as presented? All those opposed? Okay, 6-1. Six, six, Thank you. Okay, moving on. Consideration and action to approve middle school athletic fee position. <clears throat> yes, I have only one this evening. It is for Jeremy LaRose, who would be indoor track assistant. Uh, and he is uh, with funds from the school system. It is not a new position. However, he's a new person in that position. And if you read the note at the bottom, it says that Jeremy is a former Cape Elizabeth uh, middle school coach. He has an extensive track background as a player and a coach. Okay, is there a motion? I move that we approve the middle school athletic position, fee position as nominated by the superintendent. Thank you, Rebecca. A second? Second. Thank you, Linda. All, Linda. Yes. All those in favor? 7-0. Um, thank you. Consideration to approve high school athletic fee positions. Okay. I have a fairly long list. <coughs> Jeff. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Come on up, Jeff. I had submitted this a couple of weeks ago, and since then there have been a couple of adjustments because of people um, changing some jobs and um, just learning of a fingerprint thing that need to be renewed this, this afternoon. Right. So uh, Mike Holler, who is on page one, JV Baseball, um, just needs a renewal of fingerprint. It expired on January 2009. We just found that out, and um, so he has a form that he's filling out, and that should be taken care of soon. But I guess we should strike that name until that takes place. Also, um, let's see, on the back page, Bruce Wooden um, will no longer be coaching, so we can strike him. Or, yep. And then finally, um, uh, if we could strike Billy Brown um, until he is um, waiting on a um, new position. He's, I guess there are two other applicants for this one position he's applying for, for a full-time job, and his time commitment will, um, if he does get this new position, will be impacted. So um, if I could just hold off until the next, we have <laughs> spring sports start March 30th. Um, so if, if I, I think we meet the next date, 
April 14th. April 14th. Mm -hmm. um, Can you do it in workshop? We may not have a, that, a position filled there um, until that time. But so he can't give a, a definite answer on, on that commitment. Okay. So it, it might be better if we just strike that for now and then make a decision later. Okay. okay. And those were the two, or I'm sorry, the three adjustments. Hey, Jeff. Apologize. That, that was just because of when we have to submit this, it, things change, and one of them happened literally <laughs> three hours ago. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff, because those were some of the uh, pieces that I also had. So if I go down through this list, and I would like to comment on each one that Jeff also commented on. First one is Chris Haywood for Varsity Baseball. Uh, the second one is Mike Collar, who, who is applying for his renewal. Now, I'm just going to say this. You do have, you could vote for him with the understanding that he cannot coach until I get proof that he has applied for his renewal. If he gets that in, uh, Today, today or tomorrow, he will get justification that's been sent in, and at that time, because he has been approved, I can't approve him. So that is one which you, which you can do. I have Eric Higgins, Assistant Varsity Baseball. I'm, no, I'm looking at all of these, are, are all uh, not new positions. These are all positions already there. Doug Donovan, uh, Freshman Baseball. Joe H Henriksen, Varsity Softball. Kyle Henriksen, JV Softball. Ben Raymond, Varsity Boys Lacrosse, David Croft, JV Boys Lacrosse, Kurt Chapin, Varsity Girls Lacrosse. Uh, the next page is Sally Newhall, who is JV Girls Lacrosse, <coughs> Jeff Perkins, who is Assistant Varsity Girls Lacrosse, Charlie Carroll, who is Assistant Varsity Boys Lacrosse, and let me go backwards for just a minute. Both Jeff Perkins and Charlie are paid for by the boosters as opposed to his school funds. Uh, Doug Worthley, who is head uh, track coach. David Weatherby, who is the assistant track coach. We have taken Bruce Whitten off at this point. Uh, Andy Strout, who is varsity uh, tennis girls and boys. Uh, we've also taken uh, William or Billy Brown off because he does not have his, has not had his fingerprints done. And I'm also understanding we may have a replacement there. Sari Bo Bokel, did I say that right? Assistant girls tennis. Uh, and finally, Nick Garrett, who is a volunteer track assistant. So what you would be voting on is all of these candidates, with the exception of uh, Bruce Whitten, who we've taken off the list, and Billy Brown, who we've taken off the list. And you can set Mike Collar up separately if you would like, and uh, either take a vote to accept him once I have the proof that he's had the test done, or you can set him aside either way. Okay. <clears throat> I move that we approve the, um, uh, what am I doing, high school um, athletic fee positions as presented by the superintendent with the um, inclusion of Mike Collar um, with the understanding that if the fingerprinting does not go through that he will not have a position. Thank you, Rebecca. Second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Any questions or comments? I just have one quick question. I thought we've done this before, so forgive me. I thought that we couldn't have relatives in, this one, in a supervisory position according to our policy. And I know we went through this a couple Last years year. ago, and I thought that one was at the middle school and one was at the high school, but these are in fact both at the high school, one's varsity and one's JV. And that's Carl and Joe Hendrickson? Right. Yes. I remember that was discussed last year, as a matter of fact. And the question was, I think it was brought to uh, the then director, is that somebody would have to evaluate Carl Hendrickson other than Joe Hendrickson. So it would be somebody, either the director or someone else. Is that, is that an understanding you have, or has anyone mentioned that to you at this point? That has not been mentioned. Okay. That was I, that is my recollection because I think it was I think that's yeah, you brought it up before pulse. It was a and pulse. we put somebody in to take care of them at that piece. Uh, you can make a decision uh, because of policy that you don't want to have them uh, both at the high school level, particularly at the same level, or uh, Jeff will have to find someone to uh, evaluate Kyle Hendrickson uh, above and beyond Joe Hendrickson. I say that right. <clears throat> 
Anybody else have any thoughts on that? I agree that that should, because that's where we did it before right. when there was a familiar relationship. Um, I think it was the, sorry, Jeff, I think it was the uh, athletic director that stepped, I think it was too. stepped in and did that yeah. evaluation piece. Um, whether it's, you know, whether it wouldn't be done properly or not, I don't think is the question. It's right, just the, the, that's the, the policy. Point, the implication, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Um, our, just quickly, I'm guessing the new hire column wasn't filled out. Are all of these returning hires? I think they are all um, current and coaching tasks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Um, consideration to approve district co-curricular fee position or mentor teacher for the remainder of 2008-2009. Alan? And on this again, I have a recommendation for a mentor for a new teacher. I think I had mentioned it to you before. Uh, David Croft has gone into a position at the middle school, I think. Am I right about that? Is David? Pond Cove. Pond Cove, excuse me. Uh, because he is a new person, he must have a mentor. And so Carly Bean, who has been trained as a mentor, will serve as his mentor for one third of the time. In other words, the one third the, le the rest of the year. And so this is asking for approval for her to do this. I, I move that we approve the district co-curricular fee position for the remainder of 0809 as presented by the superintendent. Second. Thank you, Rebecca and Linda. Questions, comments? All those in favor? Seven zero. Um, Rebecca, consideration of policies for second reading. Oh, great. I just, okay. Um, so you have before you policies EF, EFE, KFA. There were no comments made for their first reading. No comments were received. Um, by the policy committee, and so they forward them to the school board for second reading um, in its current form. So I, I would make a motion that the board approve policies EF, food services management, policy EFE, competitive food sales, policies KF, policy KFA, smoking on school, oh, sorry, KFA, smoking on school property is um, being recommended for deletion as this is, this policy is handled now under um, a separate policy. Uh, second. Second. Thank you, Kathy. All questions or comments for Rebecca? All those in favor? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Rebecca, consideration of fo following policies for first reading. Right, so you have before you policy KI, visitors to the schools, and policy KLD, public complaints about school personnel. Um, policy KI, we um, are utilizing the recommended MSMA um, format and with the, de the deletion of their comment line on paragraph C. And then um, policy KLD, we are using the Drummond Woodson recommended format with the adjustment of um, replacing the second sentence in the third paragraph um, with the underlined. And if anybody has any comments that they'd like to make, please feel free to forward them to me um, and we'll discuss them in our policy committee meeting. Does anyone have any questions or comments right now? Can I just make one question? Yeah. Um, on visitors to the school in part B, um, <coughs> All visitors shall report to the main office upon arrival. This section shall not apply to parents or citizens who have been invited to the school for an open house performance, I understand that, or other pre-planned school program. Just curious to know, like I'm thinking a particular classroom is having the parents come in. And I think having done that in the past, I've always signed in at the office. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you want to differentiate, and I just toss it out, mm -hmm. to differentiate a pre-planned school program might be 10 parents, and I think you might want some control over that versus I can certainly understand you don't want every parent who's coming to a concert to sign in. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll discuss that in our next meeting. Thank you. Um, okay, committee reports. 
Um, just a reminder. Oh, I'm so, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Alan. I don't want to forget these two. I know people. we made an adjustment. <laughs> yeah. Rushing through this. Um, G, which was a maternity leave. That's two maternity two, two leaves. Yes. Okay, Alan. Uh, I I, uh, one I just changed. It was in your packet for, in another place, and the other one was the new one I left for you. So the first one I'll take a look at is uh, Nicole Ball. Uh, Nicole uh, wrote this letter on March 3rd, 2009, to say that she is expecting her maternity leave is from July 17th to September 11th. Uh, according to what her doctor tells her at this point, uh, she would request an extension of her leave and hope to return to Pond Cove on October 5th, 2009. I will need a substitute for the beginning of the school year through October 2nd. I have spoken with Mr. Eismeyer and he is aware of the situation. So this is one where I would need a vote from you in order to extend her uh, unpaid leave uh, to October 5th. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mary. Second? Any second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions or comments for Alan? Same question. Do we have a good long term substitute? And I look to Mr. Eismeyer. That uh, absence is going to occur in the beginning of the year, so we will have somebody that has been very successful long term substitute. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> All those in favor? 7 0, thank you. The second one is uh, from Karen Lamb, who is a teacher at the high school. Uh, she knows that uh, on August 7, 2009, she will begin her maternity leave. Uh, she is requesting an extended leave of absence for the 2009 10 academic year, returning to teach to Cape Elizabeth in August of 2010. Uh, and so, what she is requesting is a full, full year's leave of absence without pay. Um, is there a motion? Come on, somebody else. I'm so moved. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> um, second. Hey, so. Thank. Was that second. second? Thank you, Karen. Any questions or comments for Alan? I always ask because I, I get confused. <laughs> um, if we grant a leave of absence, that means we hold the position for the person. For that year. Yeah. For that year. Um, although they're not being paid beyond our, our requirement of paying them. Right. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? All those in favor? 7-0. Okay. Am I missing anything yeah. else? No, I've no. made two mistakes <laughs> tonight. It's all yours. Now. Um, committee reports. I just want to quickly remind people that, um, or the public, that notes and agendas for meetings are posted on the website, so they are um, accessible. Um, but having said that, I will ask if there's any committee chairs who have reports that they would like to make. Rebecca. I just have one thing, um, and Jeff, I'm going to have to ask you to confirm on the spot, if you may. Uh, the policy committee will be organizing a substance abuse um, public forum. And Jeff, are we confirmed for April 7th at 7 o'clock? Or is it April 9th? I was going to say the 9th is in the minutes, which is April 9th. It's <clears throat> yeah, April, so I just wanted to make that announcement. It's April 9th at 7 o'clock, and more information will be forthcoming. Thank you, Rebecca. Also, just as a comment, I said it earlier, you've done a great job of, as legislative liaison <coughs> of providing us with information. So if you have anything you would like to share. Oh. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I want to thank you for all the work that you've done. And uh, if okay, well, um, I think the um, evidence of, of the um, research that we've done into the stimulus funding is, is, um, re is reflected in our budget. Um, but yeah, through extensive um, internet searches and phone calls to Washington, D.C., we were able, and, and some timely, finally, emails from Augusta, we were able to determine that there will be, that there is something called a stabilization fund um, that the federal government is requiring the states to use to stabilize its funding to local districts. Um, and that is indeed what happened this year, and we are hopeful that it will continue next year and the following year, although I'm not sure what those amounts are going to be and how much of it will cover. But all indications are that, um, they, that, that money will be there to help us up. In addition to that, there is some um, t 
Title I and IDEA monies available to local districts. However, I believe that we were informed that we are not qualified for, we will not qualify for the Title I funds because it requires a certain type of popula student population that we do not have here in Cape Elizabeth. But we will be receiving IDEA money and uh, we have some excellent um, district leadership uh, work that's uh, occurring around this and I'm sure we'll be pleased by um, some of the areas that we'll use that funding for. Um, and finally, there is some mysterious um, grant money that's out there around technology and construction, although I have yet to see the actual names of these uh, grants or the amounts of money that's available and whether schools would be allowed to apply directly for it or whether it's actually going to be state controlled. Um, so that's the missing piece to the stimulus funding program um, and hopefully we'll get some more information in the next couple of weeks or so. I probably should just add to that quickly. I know that there's a meeting on Monday. Is Monday the 16th? I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a meeting in Augusta that I've just been invited to today uh, which will be uh, the commissioner and the, uh, her assistant will be presenting the newest information on how that money is available, et cetera. So I'll be up there on the 16th to gather that information to see where we are also. And I would just like to um, follow up on one of the board members' comments about the um, ever-present um, possibility that the state is going to uh, um, get approval for requiring and graduation requirements for all school districts. And um, that comes with a whole host of new mandates and new funding requirements. And so um, we will be watching that very closely and keeping in touch with our state legislatures very closely as that moves forward. Because I, as Mary and, and I have made, and the board as a whole has made clear to our legislators that we would, uh, th it's imperative that we avoid any more unfunded mandates. <coughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Any other committee chairs? Can I just add one piece while I'm thinking of it? Uh, if you haven't noted, we do now have a superintendent's blog oh. that is on our website. Uh, it, is, it is there. It says superintendent's blog. You hit it and you go into it. Uh, we have the three films from your workshops. Uh, we also have two blog uh, pieces of information. The newest one went in today. And I just made notes to myself for another one that I'm going to write tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we are going to continue that. So far, I've had zero comments, but I'm sure that won't last forever. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. But I did want everyone to know that that is available, and it is up, and uh, is moving ahead. Thank you, Alan. Um, anybody else? Okay. Um, public comment. We move school board agenda requests. Are there any? OK, announcement of upcoming meetings. Um, all the dates to remember are on the website. Um, and can I? There will eventually be a teaching and learning committee. Oh, meeting. yes. And we're, it, we, that is in the works. We, I think we're very close to having it. And I will be in touch with the other, at least, school board members to come up with, um, with a time. So it will happen before our next board meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I entertain a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. All those in Second. favor? Thank you. <laughs> Two moved over there. Thank you, everyone.